Governor, 10 years ago, you gave a speech before your colleagues. You shared your personal story to try and prevent from, from this bill that you're repealing today passing. You said, quote, I would have gotten pregnant then under this law. I would not, if I would have gotten pregnant then under this law, I would not be able to have coverage. You said 20 years ago I was a victim of rape. You said there are people in this chamber who have lived through things you can't even imagine, and you were one of them. And you also said let the people decide mm -hmm. if this is a bill they were really going to pass. We, we know that didn't happen. The bill passed. Now you're here to repeal what you have dubbed yourself as the rape insurance law. Tell me what this moment means for you. Well, it's a big deal. You know, you think about all that's transpired in the last year and a half. We went from Roe being overturned to um, not just, you know, to codifying reproductive rights in Michigan, and now we're expanding access for women in Michigan. But, you know, while it was a personal story that I shared that I'd never talked about personally um, or publicly, it, I think, is a, a, an example that when we get into these fights, they're worth having because we can win. It might take longer than it should. Ten years is a long time. But to be here today to know that I can get rid of this rape insurance law that has created yet another barrier for women in Michigan to getting, ha having real reproductive freedom, um, it's, it's really a, a remarkable moment for me personally, but I think most importantly for the people of my state. I just want to stick with this uh, really quickly before we move on to repro rights as a whole. Um, this is just an example of one of the many laws restricting women's access to reproductive health care that were on the books in Michigan long before Dobbs was overturned. What do you think it says that you, through your work in the legislature, now as governor, have been on offense when it comes to protecting a woman's right? Well, when the people get to decide, they overwhelmingly tell us they expect to have reproductive freedom. That's what the voters said when they went to the polls last November, not just by re-electing me and a bunch of other pro-choice leaders across the state, mm -hmm. but by amending our Constitution and saying these are rights we expect. And so now we have majorities where we can really fulfill the will of the people um, and eliminate all these additional barriers that have been created over time. Yeah, this isn't, the bill that you're signing today is not the first repro rights bill that you've signed even in the last couple of weeks. What does it say that you are perhaps uh, the, the politician on a national stage who's made abortion access and repro access really their platform? What does it say about you as a governor that you're taking this uh, issue so seriously? I think it's, it shows that when you listen to the people, when you're bold and you stay in the fight, you can win. And I'm so honored to be in this role. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful that we are here now. And as a mom of two young women, I'm really proud that we are putting Michigan center stage as a state that um, protects women's ability to make her own decisions about her body and her future. It's the most important economic decision a woman will make in her lifetime is whether and when to bear a child. Mm -hmm. And that is solely her decision to make. And so many states now, I mean, are going to have uh, codifying reproductive access on their ballots. Ohio just codified the right to choose on their ballot. Voters there in a red state did that. But really it was Michigan that sort of laid the groundwork, laid the blueprint, if you will, that many states now are following. Do you think that Democrats on the national stage understand what a motivating issue reproductive freedom is at the ballot box? I think they do, and to see what happened in Kansas and then Kentucky and Ohio. Now, I'm a Michigander. This is football season. I don't usually compliment Ohio, but hats off to the people of Ohio who rejected all the misinformation and um, codified this right for, for women in, in that state just south of us. Mm -hmm. I'm really pleased to see that, and any leader who's not listening to the people, who's not paying attention to this, um, that may not survive another election. You talked about the last election. I mean, it was historic in Michigan. You managed to flip um, really statewide, down ballot. You had Democrats elected in large part because of voters turning out 
to vote to codify a woman's right to choose. Do you think abortion will remain as a top issue motivating voters to get out to the polls in 24? Listen, there's no question that abortion will continue to be a central issue for voters. You look at the new Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives and how backward his positions are. He's the top Republican in this country. You listen to what all the Republican candidates for president say on that stage. Sure, some of it might say it in a way that seems a little nicer or softer, but the fact of the matter is every one of them has vowed to sign a national abortion ban. So even in a state where abortion rights are codified and protected, this remains a precarious time. And that's why this upcoming federal election is going to be crucial on so many issues from climate to voting rights to the health of our democracy and our individual right to make our decision about our own lives. You brought up Republicans obviously being loud about what they want to do on a national level to restrict abortion access. Do you think Democrats need to do more. I know they don't have the numbers right now in Congress, but should they be forcing those tough votes? Should the president be talking about this issue more? I think every Democratic leader should take every opportunity to give voice to reproductive freedom. This is a fundamental for so many people in this country, and it's not just women. Mm -hmm. It is families all across the country who are confronting circumstances you and I can't even fathom. And that's why it should be solely within their ability to make a decision that is right for them. Whether they live in Texas or Michigan or Maine or Montana, all people in this country should have that freedom. And that's very much in peril in this nation right now and could be for all of us. The road for President Biden in many ways runs through Michigan. I know you are um, one of his top surrogates and you support him. What do you think he needs to do perhaps more of to make sure that he does secure the victory in Michigan like he did in 2020? I think the president's right on the fundamentals, right? We know that there have been so many threats to just the foundation of our democracy. We know that people are quick to threaten violence against fellow Americans with whom they don't see eye to eye. We know that the effort to undermine confidence in our institutions, whether it's climate policy or individual freedoms or just the right to vote, all of these things are on this upcoming ballot. Now, this president can't control global inflation. No one leader can. But he's made decisions that have put more money in people's pockets, whether it's lowering the cost of prescription drugs or making sure that people can access affordable health care. Mm -hmm. All of these are things that are going to be front and center. We're a year out. I always remind people, a year out from my re-election, a lot of people are writing my political obituary. Even weeks before. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And so until there's a matchup, uh, we're going to see polls that say one thing or another. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, Americans are smart, they're pragmatic, and they're going to vote for leaders who actually care about them and are delivering for them and are protecting this democracy. And that describes President Biden. No one knows this state more than you do. No one knows the voters here as well as you do. And certainly with all the news of the last month, especially with the war overseas in Israel and in Gaza, you have very large constituency of Arab American voters, but also of Jewish Americans living right here in Michigan. Do, do you worry uh, that President Biden is going to have a tough time with those groups, whether it's on the Arab American side or the Jewish American side? I think, you know, as the governor of Michigan, I'm really grateful and proud that we have a robust Jewish community in Michigan. Mm -hmm. We also have a beautiful, robust Arab community, a Palestinian community, Muslim community. Those things are not all the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important to recognize that these are, are folks that have lived as neighbors in harmony for decades in this state. The Michigan I know and love is a place where all people are valued and protected and respected under the law. Um, what's happening in, in Gaza and Israel has been hard, and there are a lot of people who are hurting. I think it's important to recognize that. Wherever an innocent person is killed, I think that it is cause to mourn and to reach out and to support one another. These geopolitical issues are taking a toll. And so I do worry about how people are, 
are feeling and mourning and concerned for their loved ones. And yet, it's my job as governor of Michigan to make sure that I do everything to bring down the heat here at home and to protect people. And that's where my focus is, and I'm grateful that the president has shared that focus. Uh, one of our uh, reporters, Shaq Brewster, was here speaking to the Arab American community, and many leaders told him that they're not going to show up. They're just not going to go to the ballot box. We know in 2020, President Biden won by 150,000 votes. That's about how many uh, Arab American, some of them Muslim Americans, came out and supported and voted in the election. So with those tight margins, what's the message that you think the president should be picking up from that? Well, I think that every community is important and showing up and listening is going to be continue to be an important thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'll also share that these no one group is um, is monolithic, mm -hmm. right? Um, I talk to voters all the time who care about climate, who care about uh, whether it's choice or it's gun violence, who mm -hmm. care about crime and want a president who is investing in communities. I think that there are a lot of important impacts from this upcoming election that are going to compel people mm -hmm. to get out and vote, but I don't think anyone should be taken for granted. I certainly, um, I really have focused on getting into all 83 counties in this state. I think it's important to listen and to show up for people, and I think if, when the president does that, no one's better at it than he is. Uh, you have a lot of women in this state, just to, to go back to the topic of reproductive rights, that rely on you, that depend on you, that see you as somebody who is fighting for their rights. There's a woman in Texas right now who's fighting to get an emergency abortion because her life-threatening complications are not being seen as something that qualifies under their medical exceptions. Given all of that, is there a bigger stage, perhaps the White House, where you think your work, specifically on this issue, is going to be important? I know not in 24, but in the future. I don't know about that. What I do know is that it is immoral that the state of Texas is imposing what they are imposing on this woman who is confronting a horrific situation. Mm -hmm. She needs health care. She deserves health care. And for any individual politicians at their capital to stand in her way from getting it and from being a mom in the future is just cruel and it's immoral. And so that's why I think my leadership at, at the state level is so important, but mm -hmm. also why we tell people, you know, Michigan's a place where you'll have you'll be respected and protected under the law. I'm not suggesting everyone should move to Michigan, but for those that can, this is a place that sees you, that will fight for you, and will ensure you've got economic opportunity. My heart goes out to that woman, and I pray and hope that she gets the justice she deserves. Yeah, but just to be clear and put a finer point on that, you know, not everyone can move to states that right. do have, you know, even the ability to put these ballot initiatives uh, on, on their ballot, to have that constitutional right. And so with that said, do you think there should be a Democrat in the White House that is going to make reproductive access their top priority, their top focus, and then force Congress to act? I do think that we need leaders in Washington who are making reproductive freedom a top issue. The top issue, well, I don't know that it's more important than voting rights mm -hmm. and the fundamentals of our democracy, mm -hmm. because that's how we secure reproductive mm -hmm. freedom. That's how we secure common sense anti-gun violence laws. That's how we secure a policy that um, it makes America a leader when it comes to fighting climate change. Mm -hmm. All of these things are important and they all at the end of the day stem from that fundamental right to vote, to have your voice counted, and to protect this democracy. And I think all of that is very much at risk and it all rises to the top. And you, to be fair, you've done a lot of work on all of those issues, on gun violence this last week alone. You had the Oxford school shooter who was in court, who was sentenced. You've done work to pass gun safety measures here. Uh, so just to be clear, are you leaving the door open to perhaps moving to a bigger stage uh, following your term as governor? I know you wanted to serve that term out. Yes, I'm going to be governor for three more years. Mm -hmm. I know that I will um, always stay very focused on, you know, lending my voice and being a part of a solution, mm -hmm. uh, but I am not sitting in any rooms plotting beyond the next three years. I'm going to keep my eye on the ball right here in Michigan. Vivek Ramaswamy had recently suggested that the poten potential assassination attempt, because it was against you, the kidnapping plot, was, quote, could have been an inside job. 
ridiculous. He's not a serious person, and it's sad that he would use his platform to um, belittle what was a very serious threat to anyone else's life, mine in particular, in this situation. But um, the violence that's playing out across this country against people who see the world differently is a real threat to our democracy. And anyone who's running for the highest office in the land should take it seriously, not make it a joke. Are you concerned uh, with potentially being governor of this state with the former president, Donald Trump, back in the White House, who certainly threatened you openly on social media, at rallies? Does that worry you? Well, I think that we're seeing an increase in violence in this country, period. I should worry everybody. It's not about me. It's about all of us. It's about future generations of Americans who should be able to engage in robust debate without worrying about whether or not it might cost them their lives. We talked about the robust Arab community, Muslim community, Jewish community here. Uh, you had a lot of discussions on campuses across the state. Of course, there are many colleges and universities here. You just had the UPenn president step down. Of course, that is a really big topic right now in Washington, D.C. for many reasons. Um, but I'm just curious your opinion. Do you think college leaders here should be doing more to protect students from anti-Semitism and Islamophobia? I'll just say I thought that the hearings in D.C. were appalling and shocking. And um, I know that there are many types of conversations happening on campuses, and campuses are places where there should be conversation and debate. Uh, but I think they should also be very clear what is hate speech and what is not protected. Uh, last question, because I know we're running out of time. You're a Spartan. Yes. I know uh, you're not a big fan of University of Michigan, but they will be in the Rose Bowl in a couple of weeks. Uh, so what do you feel about that? I say go blue. I got three <laughs> kids at the University of Michigan, so So it's a rivalry blue. in your house all the time also. <laughs> it, is, I mean, it is, but you know what? <laughs> if Michigan's not playing Michigan State, we're all Wolverines. <laughs> fair, fair. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.